morning, church family and friends. We hope that wherever you are this morning, that you and your family are happy and healthy and well. Wherever you are, please join us as we worship together.
Happy Sabbath, church. It is so good to be here with you today. Uh, the church, like many of you already know, and uh, our pastor has said before, it is empty. However, our hearts are filled with Jesus Christ. And that is why we keep going in the middle of the storm. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, O Lord, for being our creator God, for being in control of heaven and earth. We thank you, O Lord, and we ask that you continue to pour your Holy Spirit within our hearts. We need you daily, Lord. These days, we need you minute by minute. As we take each step, Father God, in whatever you have called us to do and the purposes that you have for us, Lord, we ask that you will be ever present. Help each member of our church here in Visalia. We ask that you will fill their hearts right now with your Holy Spirit as they prepare to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for our worship teams. Thank you, Lord, for our children worship teams and for Pastor Gary and, and all the team that just comes together every week, Lord, to prepare these awesome uh, worship-filled, um, love-filled uh, uh, worship for you, Father God, for you are the only one that is worthy of our love and our praise and our worship. So we come to you, Lord, on this Sabbath morning, humble, humbly asking you to fill us with your Holy Spirit and to give us courage and bravery for another week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, church family. Welcome again to church. So glad that you've all joined us and welcome to each and every one of you. Today we continue our series, The Vindication of Love, part four, The Nature of the Conflict. We've been looking at the story of God from scripture and the picture that it paints of the God that we serve, the God of heaven and earth, the God who created all things. And we've seen so far that in this universe, God um, begins with simply who he is in eternity. He is love. All of his creation is based on the law of love. And so as we've been exploring the God story, we've been seeing God's commitment to love. 
And in reality, what that commitment on God's part means in terms of God's relationship to his creatures. Scripture paints a picture of this cosmic conflict between God and Satan. We've seen that clearly. And it's important for us to understand the nature of that conflict. Because the nature, it's like if you were to look at the Jews and the Jewish nation when uh, the Messiah came, when Jesus came. They perceived the nature of his kingdom uh, to be an earthly kingdom of, of earthly rule and power. But the nature of God's kingdom wasn't earthly rule at that point. It was to move from an old covenant to a new covenant, a spiritual kingdom, if you will. So understanding the nature of the cosmic conflict helps us to better understand and interpret what scripture has to say, particularly as it lays out the God story, the story of salvation, uh, the story uh, prophetically of, of what would come uh, in Bible times as well as in our time. And so this nature of this conflict, it, scripture depicts this dispute uh, over God's moral character and his rulership, his government, his governance. So Satan had, had raised cosmic allegations before the heavenly council, claiming that God is not wholly good, loving, or just. Meaning that this was a conflict regarding what one believes or does not believe. In other words, when Satan made these accusations against God that were false, the heavenly beings present and that heavenly council had to begin judging in their own hearts and minds who to believe, God or Satan. And so this epistemic conflict really is about what one chooses to believe or not believe. Now, God maintains his commitment to the freedom for all creatures to exercise uh, their free will to choose. And so he was, God initially and continued to be all the way through scripture and even to our present day and actually through even the very end of the destruction of evil. He maintains his commitment to freedom. The amount of freedom that is necessary for love to flourish. All created beings were free then to choose to believe or not believe. So we can see that this conflict isn't just about ontological power. This conflict cannot be won by a mere exercise of power in God's sovereignty. It wouldn't prove anything in terms of in the hearts and minds of the beings. So I want to go back to the cosmic allegations in the light of Genesis chapter 3. So we've already seen that this, this conflict, uh, the slanderous charges were leveled against God in heaven. But in the very beginning of scripture in Genesis 3, after creation, we see that Satan shows up and, and he begins to do on earth exactly what he did in heaven. So we see the devil slandering God's character. He's slyly alleging that God is not an all benevolent ruler. And this attack then prompts humans to distrust God's character, which led them to break their relationship with God. And that in turn led to the broken relationships with one another in humanity as well. Adam and Eve, in essence, were given the sovereignty to rule the earth. However, they failed to rule rightly in God's stead. And consequently, the world then became under the dominion, the powers of darkness. Satan became the ruler of this earth. This world became his domain. Now, in the midst of 
mankind's fall and failure there in the garden with Adam and Eve. Even in Genesis 3, we see God speaking to the servant, servant and, and giving a messianic prophecy, uh, so to speak. In other words, God was declaring what he was purposing to do. That, that this failure on the part of man was not the end of the story. Notice in Genesis 3, beginning in verse 14. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your be belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, it's interesting that right here at the fall of man, what we see is God's response to man's sin. So as we go through this God story, what we begin to notice are patterns, patterns of how beings relate to God and patterns of how God relates to his beings. And so God reacts to Satan's fall. He, he exercises love, mercy, and a time period to try to win his heart over and, and influence Satan to repent. He does not. God in Genesis doesn't leave humanity lost. God's response to sinful man is love. And even in the moment of their failure, God speaks the promise that this serpent was cursed and that a deliverer would come. Now, <clears throat> when the Messiah did come, it's interesting to notice that the devil's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness mirrors the temptations that he brought to Eve. In other words, Satan aims his deceptions and temptations at tarnishing God's reputation, attempting to usurp the honor and worship due only to Yahweh. So church, think about this even in your own life. The pattern of history. So, so even the pattern of Satan himself is consistently to accuse God slanderously, distorting an accurate picture of God so that beings and creatures would not worship or submit or even respond to want to be in a relationship with loving God. And in essence, then, he defers their worship away from the true God of heaven to himself and his kingdom of darkness. This pattern is repeated throughout history all the way down to our current day, even in your life and mine. We experience these temptations, these deceptions, the deceptions prophetically all the way through time, from Genesis to Revelation, all the way between God's creation and the final eschaton when sin is destroyed. Satan's mode of operation. Satan's pattern of behavior, his strategy remains consistent. His deceptions and temptations at tarnishing God's reputation, in essence, are attempting to usurp the honor and worship due only to God. In other words, this is a battle of ideas. This is a battle of ideas in the universe. And, and this battle of ideas really consists of two primary themes. Number one, cosmic charges have been brought against God's character. And secondly, the enemy has a desire to usurp God's worship as king. Satan knew that if he could call into question God's character, in essence, he was calling into, into question who God was, his identity. He was questioning the identity of God. 
the nature of his moral character, the, the, the nature of his rulership, uh, the nature of his, his kingdom. And in essence, if he could get the beings of the universe to distrust God in his character, that would then impact their willingness to worship the God of the universe, the creator God, the king of all kings. This theme of cosmic allegations against God's character is bookended in the book of Revelation as well. Notice Revelation 12 and uh, verses 7 to 9. Then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle. And, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. So Revelation is also deeply concerned about God's righteous character, the issue of worship, and this cosmic conflict with the dragon. From Genesis to Revelation, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, the Word of God. The, the questions regarding God's character and rulership, you see they're raised both in heaven and on earth. And we see the vastness of this conflict from Genesis throughout the entire Scripture. So the reality, because this is a battle of ideas, it's a battle of of choosing who to believe, choosing what to believe about God. No amount of power exercised by a king would prove to his subjects that he is not unjust. So likewise, no show of sovereign power by the creator can prove to all his creation that he is loving and just. You see, a conflict over character cannot be settled by sheer power, but requires demonstration. So the God story of Scripture then is this cosmic battle, this cosmic story that's taking place in the universe that finds its way to planet Earth. Now, imagine for a moment God's challenge to communicate to fallen humanity the reality of what's going on in the universe. I mean, you have <laughs> creator God and finite fallen human beings. And God has to figure out a way. He, he has to develop a strategy. He makes a choice. How is he going to communicate? How is he going to tell the God story, the story about himself to humanity so that humanity can no one understand what's at stake regarding the plan of salvation and the coming Messiah in Christ. And even all the way down to our day, living in the end times, so to speak. So here this infinite creator is trying to tell the story to finite sinful beings. Imagine from God's perspective how, how far... He must condescend to, to work within the limits of human language. And here we find an important principle, and that is this. And we've seen this so far in, as we've studied in this series. When God communicates, he draws on the language, culture, and experience of the people he speaks through to communicate his message 
effectively. So God is, is moving from the throne in heaven to fallen human beings on planet earth, confining himself and working within the language, the culture, and the experience of sinful people. And he does so in a way that will communicate most effectively with them. So notice the imagery now that we've seen, that we've discovered, that we've looked at in the Bible, describing everything we've studied so far in this series. The imagery that God uses to tell the story is one of conflict, war, battle. And we're discovering that this isn't just a battle that is, is like any other physical battle. Uh, the typical rules of warfare where one entity tries to prove itself stronger and overcoming the other is not the nature of this battle. Because this conflict is over character, rulership, and worship of God. So God's chosen means of communication, telling the God story, beginning to explain to humanity and continuing to explain to humanity all the way through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is conflict of opposing kingdoms. God is using this imagery of a cosmic battle, and he does so, as we found out last week, in the, in the context of a heavenly council of celestial rulers. We saw last week from God's word how uh, Job was very clear and we saw an insight into uh, a behind the scenes look, if you will, about how this heavenly council might work. And as we track with the stories and the scriptures, the divine purpose of this heavenly council becomes evident as we look at Job and the others. The council serves as an impartial, open, transparent, extended demonstration providing evidence upon which all creatures in the universe could exercise their free will to believe God or believe Satan. That they could choose to believe that God is who he says he is or not. Now, you'll remember also last week that we saw this, this cosmic uh, courtroom a picture, if you will, in, in the scripture depicting God as a cosmic judge. I don't know if you remember this, this text in Psalm 82 and verse 1. God presides over heaven's court. He pronounces judgment on the heavenly beings. Throughout scripture, God as cosmic judge is seen to bring charges against nations, against their gods, and sometimes even against his covenant people. In, in other instances, God as cosmic judge actually defends or vindicates the cause of his covenant people. And in so doing, he vindicates himself in claiming such people as his very own. Satan's slanderous charges actually then places God on trial in the universe. Now imagine this. You have this eternal creator God sitting on the throne, the judge of the entire universe, and Satan is calling into question the very judge himself. In essence, declaring that there's a mistrial in play that, that God is not who he said he is and, and you know, throwing uh, Lucifer and his demons out of heaven. That, that was unfair. That's not right. And God then is placed on trial. The, the conflict in the universe is a matter of epistemic decisions. Therefore, it's not a matter of sheer force. There's no being in the universe that could challenge God's omnipotent sovereignty. 
on trial then in this cosmic courtroom drama is truth. The truth about God's character, the truth about God's rulership, his covenantal faithfulness on trial in this cosmic courtroom drama is the very righteousness of God. Church, God's process of judgment provides evidence to the universe demonstrating his character of love demonstrating the truth of his identity, demonstrating that God is who he says he is. And he functions according to the laws of the universe and the most foundational law of the universe is love because that is the very nature of God himself. So in essence, we see this picture uh, in scripture of, of God sitting on his throne around this council of celestial rulers. And now God is called into question. The judge is now called into question. And every being in the universe will exercise their free will that God has given them to, in essence, judge God. That based on the evidence, who should they choose to believe? What should they choose to believe? God thus demonstrates through the story of Scripture his character. His interaction. Remember we talked about these, these patterns. The pattern of Satan and Lucifer um, accusing God, bringing temptations forward, deceptions forward. We see patterns of humanity responding to God, rejecting God, rebelling against God. And we see patterns in Scripture of God's response to the beings of heaven like Lucifer and his demons. We see God's pattern of response to fallen humanity. The reality is, church, that you are being called upon to pass your judgment on the God of heaven and earth. God has given you the free will. And you have the power. You are the only one that can exercise your, your choice, your right, in terms of choosing who to believe. So my question for you today is what does the evidence tell you? Has God given you enough evidence in your life? Has God given you enough evidence in the Holy Scriptures to sink your faith into trusting Him to be who He says He is? What evidence has God given you in all the days of your life that He is who He says He is? You see, in essence, each being, you and I, will make a judgment call. We will make a choice. We will evaluate whether we are going to believe what God says or what Satan, the enemy, says. Now, it's also interesting to note that Paul, the apostle, tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, he says, don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? 
You see, God shares the role of judgment for those who believe in him, those who submit to his rulership. And in the end, the entire universe, along with God's people, his covenant people, will be a part of evaluating the records of the human story, the records of the God story, to discern and to pass judgment on those that were lost, acknowledging that God was right and excluding them from the kingdom, even to the point of judging the angels, Lucifer and his demons, that God was right in all of his, in all of his ways. He was just. In James 2 and verse 13, Beautiful, beautiful promise. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You and you alone can exercise your free will to make the choice regarding your eternal destiny. What does the evidence demonstrate to you? In the end, you'll have to weigh that evidence and make a choice, make a decision. Will you be a part of God's kingdom of light? Or, or will you choose to be a willing participant in the demonic kingdom of darkness? <laughs> in love. The, the, in love, the God's story is about Abba Father, your Father, through Jesus Christ, his one and only Son, offering you adoption into the family, into the kingdom, into the kingdom of life. Choose wisely. I'd rather have Jesus than sin.
Let us pray. Abba, Father, your people bow before you just now in awe of your eternal commitment to love. Thank you for providing your son, Jesus, that provides adoption into the family, that we could be eternally part of the kingdom of light. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to each and every person listening just now. God, give them in that supernatural way that only you can clarity regarding the evidence both in Scripture and in their lives of the truth about you, that you are who you say you are, that you indeed are a God of love who is good and righteous in all his ways. And in the end, you will bring deliverance to your people. So God, we want to just lean into your arms right now and choose you. Whatever the obstacles are that are preventing us from saying, yes, Lord, oh, do that, do that mighty, mighty cosmic thing that only you can do. That God, we would fall into your arms. and forever spend eternity with you. Is my prayer, in Jesus' name I pray.